So before I read the bios of our panelists and we get into questions, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of my own beliefs and values and experience. So for over 30 years, I've operated pretty much from every side of the funding conversation. As a grant program applicant and as an executive director myself, I've written and submitted many grants to a variety of public and private funders, managed complex awards, and figured out all those final reports like you guys do. As a volunteer board member, I've been to interviews and supported uh, programs and grants as well. As a grants manager for funding agencies, I've designed and managed many of those programs. Please don't throw anything at me. And um, have facilitated the adjudication of grant submissions and provided support for many of the applicants. As an independent reviewer, I have read and formally reviewed thousands, and I thought about that, and it's literally thousands of grant applications for public and private funders. For those of you who can remember site visits, I used to do that as well. As a private consultant, I've supported grant program design and management and client organizations applications. And as a private business owner, especially as an independent gallery director, I've self-funded programs in the community interest, so I've been a funder. My beliefs, values, and emerging independent work are keenly focused on the evolution of organizations and their structures and their processes, based both on my prior experience in the social benefit field, but now in combination with my formal studies in system science and the principles of self-awareness, transformative innovation, and human development, with one overarching goal, to birth the emerging future in the present. I believe that's the goal we should all have. So I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists. To my left is Joseph Pucci, who's Principal Financial Advisor with Bernstein, where he advises individuals, families, executives, and business owners how to best balance risk and reward in capital markets. He's worked both a large company executive and as an entrepreneur, and as a trusted advisor to many as they navigate startups, growth, exit planning, and management compensation. He serves as chair of the Exit Planning Exchange in Connecticut and New York City, and as president of the Westport Library Board of Trustees. He's also served on the boards of the Connecticut Food Bank, the Westport Art Center, and as a member of Social Venture Partners. He has an MBA from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Science from of uh, Colorado University in Boulder and lives in Westport. Thank you for being here, Joseph. Next. <laughs> Next on our panel is Holly Hotchner, who was executive director of New York's Museum of Arts and Design, which was formerly the American Craft Museum, and previously was the director of the New York Historical Society, where she restructured the administration and raised more than $40 million for its collections. Earlier, she had been chief conservator at the Historical Society, a conservation fellow at the Met, and had held positions at the Tate, the Hirshhorn, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Metropolitan. Those sound pretty uh, notable. She also holds an MA in Art History from NYU's Institute of Fine Arts and a BA in Art History and Studio Art from Trinity College. She served on numerous panels for government funding for the arts as a junior, as a juror rather, for exhibitions and artists awards. She's recently founded Holly Hotchner Fine Arts Management, providing collections management, cataloging, and conservation services. We also have Senator Tony Huang, a Republican member of the Connecticut State Senate, representing District 28. I never know what those districts mean, so I'm going to read that that's Easton, Fairfield, Newtown, Westport, and Weston. <laughs> he serves as co-chair of the Housing Committee, vice chair of the Aging Committee, and vice chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. He's a member of the Judiciary Committee and the Planning and Development Committee. As a Fairfield resident and married father of two, he was born in Taiwan to parents that had escaped communist China as teens and lived under martial law in Taiwan. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in labor relations and organizational behavior from Cornell University, and after working for United Technologies, entered the executive search business and founded a company recruiting technology executives. In 2014, Tony became the first Asian Pacific American state senator in Connecticut history. And in 2016, he spoke at our first Connecticut Arts Day in a very long time. Thank you. 
And finally, we have Stuart Katz on the panel, who chairs Cohen and Wolf's litigation group, where he represents employers in litigating employment-related claims. He also represents professionals and executives in matters relating to their employment and was named 2016 Lawyer of the Year for Employment Law by the best lawyers in America. He counsels employers and employees regarding personnel policies, handbooks, and employee discipline. Mr. Katz chairs Cohen and Wolf's marketing committee, and that's what guides the firm's community involvement initiatives. Attorneys at the firm are involved in over 100 cultural, civic, political, and religious organizations. Cohen and Wolf's commitment to community engagement dates back to 1951, when Herbert Cohen and Austin Wolf founded the firm. 60 years later, the firm's 50 attorneys carry on this proud tradition. So each of our panelists has been asked to give a five-minute statement from their own background and experience in the area of their uh, kind of their position in this ecology of funding organizations. I'm going to time them and gesticulate as wildly as needed to get them to stop <laughs> so that we have time for questions. So I'm going to turn this over. We have another mic down there. Okay, Joseph. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So as you heard, I'm Joe Pucci, and I think um, in, in terms of the title of the program of philanthropists, I'll, I'll just make note and disclaimer that I'm a philanthropist with a small P, not a large P. Uh, <laughs> serving as a financial advisor and working with very wealthy clients, uh, certainly I've worked with them and advised them on large P philanthropy type initiatives. So um, I'll try to give you that perspective from both sides, right? So. You know, I can say for myself um, and most people that I know personally, uh, we tend to give where we're involved. Um, and we tend to give where we're asked by somebody who uh, means something to us, is important to us, right? Um, and sometimes we give because there's a tax benefit. And certainly a large P in, in my world as a financial advisor, that's often the motivation for some of the larger gifts and more structured gifts that we see is, you know, somebody's having a, a significant tax event, selling a business, uh, you know, uh, some major inheritance, some multi-generational wealth planning where you'll see some of the larger uh, charitable trusts or donor advised funds uh, and certainly gifting of stock or gifting of IRAs and things like that. Um, you know, I think in terms of trends that we've seen, um, you know, things that that hold back or I think make people um, hesitant to, to give in the last decade is certainly the financial crisis, even though it's now approaching a decade ago. You know, we're not quite a decade, but, but getting pretty close. Uh, people still feel that pain and have that fear of, uh, and I found especially as, as they get later in life and don't have income or ways to replace uh, lost income, they hold on to what they have more carefully. And even though we can run them models and show them, uh, you know, with high level of confidence you have too much and you need to gift or you need to give to charity or you need to do different strategies, often they're fearful of, well, what if that, you know, big recession hits again and I lose half of what I have, you know, do I really have enough? Um, you know, so that's certainly been a trend that I think has affected giving uh, over the last decade. I think um, um, the uncertainty in stock market values, even though we're at, you know, all-time highs and frequently in the news you're hearing the, the Dow and the, and the NASDAQ and the S&P are all hitting all-time highs, which means people's portfolios, if they're invested, are hitting all-time highs. Uh, they still don't feel fully confident that that's really there, right? There's, a, there's uncertainty, political uncertainty, economic uncertainty. And so that often uh, has people giving less than, than what they might have, have in past. Um, some of the things we do to, uh, you know, to ease that uncertainty is, is running modeling, honestly. You know, so uh, getting people to think rationally about what they have and rationally about the gift and also showing them the leverage in the gift, you know. So uh, instead of writing the check for, you know, whether it's a thousand or ten thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million, give appreciated stock, right? So it's a way you can give more, uh, actually, by costing you less, you know, right? If you're if you're earning at a max tax rate, and and you know, due to pay capital gains of 23.8% plus a state tax, uh, you know, another 6.5% on top of that, right? You're talking over 30% of, 
of, you know, if you sell the stock and then write a check to the charity, right, that's a 30% different in tax. You give the stock, you can afford to give 30% more or sometimes even more, right? So um, a lot of people, uh, especially people we see in Fairfield County, uh, have either earned or inherited, you know, GE stock, Exxon stock, IBM stock, any number of big Pfizer, big corporations, right, that have been in the area for a long time, United Technologies that have seen massive appreciation, you know, AT&T, right? Some people are still holding stock from AT&T before the breakup in 1984, which means they have now a dozen stocks, you know, and, and all of that can be given away, and the donor is getting the tax deduction for the full value as well as not having to pay that capital gain. So, you know, that's a technique to, I think, encourage people to give more or be more confident in the giving that they're doing, right? They can, they can kind of give more with less. Um, uh, the other, uh, I think, difficulties are, are well stated in the press and covered in these stats, but, you know, you see, uh, I see um, wealthy donors creating uh, um, uh, tax residency in Florida, and if it's not Florida, it might be Texas or Arizona, right, places where there is no s state income tax, no estate tax, and even places that, that give them a break on uh, retirement income, like Georgia, for example. That movement out in itself is not so much a problem because often they still have a house here and still have ties to the organizations, but a lot of their tax advisors are advising them to sever the ties completely and do not give to the organizations in your hometown or home state anymore. Make everything as clear as possible you've left the state and your heart is now in Florida. And that's, I think, a real challenge for both the givers who have obligations and feel obligations to the local charities here um, you know, because there's no end to the movement out of the state uh, anytime soon, as far as I can see. Thank you very much. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Uh, okay, I'll go quickly, but I'm uh, going to give you much more hands-on kind of uh, idea of the landscape from my perspective. For, I have foundation under my sort of area here, so I will talk about foundations, and I'm not talking about individual foundations where an individual puts their money into that mechanism. I'm talking about bigger foundations that are run uh, by boards and so on. Um, the big foundations in New York, actually, most of them in the arts have spent out and they were designed to do that. So in my lifetime, Diamond, Aster, Dana, all the big foundations have gone out of business. And there, is many, there are many, many fewer foundations, uh, which is both good news and not so good news. Um, the, of course, it's all about personal relationships, whether it's the head of the foundation giving area or the individual who's going to set up their own foundation. The news in, in foundations, and I was very involved with Newman's Own and setting up their foundation, is that there's tremendous concern about the arts and funding, and I'm gonna say it, Trump, and what's going to happen under either four years or, God help us, eight years. Um, and so there's a great deal of innovation going on and loosening up of guidelines, and sorry to anyone who loves them. But uh, the, for example, the Rockefeller Foundation has gone way outside of its guidelines, traditional guidelines, and has now created some new funds to see what they can do in spurring arts activities. They have a program called 100 Resilient Cities, which was for all of the United States, and it, it's a prototype for how foundations can get involved to help uh, it's all about the arts, in this case, uh, rejuvenation. The Mellon Foundation, one of the biggest arts foundations in the United States, which has traditionally focused on scholarship, is going, again, way outside of that area and is um, asking leaders to come and be um, fellows and giving them money to create pilot programs in different places and see how those work. Uh, and some, Karen Brooks Hopkins, who was the founding dir director for many years of BAM and hugely uh, wonderful fundraiser, 
just created three programs, one in Connecticut that Mellon is looking at the uh, model. Ford has, Darren Walker, sadly, the arts isn't his main focus, diversity is, but if you're involved with trying to get diversity of your boards, your staff, your audience, there is opportunity there. He's putting millions and millions of dollars forward. Getty recently went out of its, the biggest arts founded in the United States, uh, of course, funded Pacific Standard Time, which was to get every single arts organization in California to work together to show what was happening artistically in California. It took 10 years, gazillions of dollars, and it's now being used as a model. Uh, Chicago is the next city. Terra Foundation stepped up way outside of its guidelines. They give to a very specific American art thing. They've put 10 million up front to show and showcase the arts of Chicago. It's a seven-year project. Pew is doing it in Philadelphia. Bloomberg will possibly step up in New York. I don't know the model in Connecticut, and I'm going to speak as fast as I can, but I have just recently, I'm a New Yorker, and I have recently come to try to be involved here. What I find tremendously discouraging, and I, I sort of am looking at you, there's tremendous hedge fund wealth in Connecticut. The giving is in New York. It is not in Connecticut. And uh, it's disgraceful that people, it's not a Florida tax thing, it's that people think they get more visibility in New York. It's an ego thing. So I would urge everyone to get, and I can get to some of them, we all can. You live here, invest in your community. They have enough to do both. I mean, it's not either or. Um, and that's something I'm very dedicated to and I'm working on. The, the other thing is, um, there are a lot of collaborations going on. Some of the major foundations are pooling their funds so that they can have much bigger funds. And there's a startup, three startups that I'm tangentially involved with. One is sort of a revolving, a bank that would be a revolving fund for the arts organizations uh, for capital money for short-term loans with very low interest rates to no interest rates. It's a really interesting model. It would be for the whole country, blah, blah, more things. I'm out of time. But there also is a very big fund that we're working on to help small organizations with small endowments, if you're lucky enough to have one, that your endowment could be managed in a much bigger pool of money, giving you much bigger returns. And it's uh, almost ready to be announced, and I will be involved with that. Anyway, that's some things. And, and Holly, you're more than welcome Thanks to take some of my time. Um, you know, I'll start by, uh, we, we've all heard this phrase, right? I'm from the government. And I'm here to help you. <laughs> and in this case, I, I want to take a moment and thank uh, and wish Christina uh, the best of health with the baby and, and acknowledge that indeed, um, with, with some of the challenging issues that we have in the state, the governor, through DECD Commissioner Smith, has created the Office of the Arts and offered it from a context of, of support, engagement, and a real joy and passion for the arts, but also to kind of pivot and bring it as an economic engine, as a driver of, of branding for Connecticut, as celebration, and, and also dollars and cents. And, and I think that's one of the most interesting things about when you talk about culture, when you talk about arts. We enjoy it. It, 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 it cuts across all segments of politics, race, religion, gender, orientation. Music, arts, and culture celebrates all of that. People don't care. They really don't. You know, and I think the most important thing is, as I look at the pivot of the challenging budget that we have, you know, right now, we don't have a budget. The budget year ends June 30th. There are three budgets out there, the governor's budget, the Democratic leadership, the Republican leadership. And in a way, I would say, people would say, geez, you're not doing the job. Get back to work. And, and I'm committed to doing that. But for people to fully understand, for us not to have done a budget, maybe, maybe I'm eligible for president of the Optimist Club, 
it's actually something positive. And I'll tell you why. Because for the past two budget cycles, we do biannual budgets. For the past two budget cycles, we were able to cobble up a budget through the legislative majority and the governor, which meant one party and literally half of the state was kept out of the negotiations. But what happened was we crafted a budget and we celebrated by passing it before the deadline. But a month later, it was leaking like the Titanic. And here's the problem. You base your budgeting based upon the dollars that have been promoted and promised. And when we don't do a solid budget, it creates havoc midterm for how you plan your business. We do that to municipalities. We do that to nonprofits. We do that to every institution that has a piece of the pie in this discussion. So actually, this year, we're actually buckling down and saying, no, let's produce a budget that's line by line. Let's produce a budget that's going to pre create a predictable environment. And one of the things we're talking about in regards to philanthropy, not only is a state a role player in, in regards to money and, donation, and, and, and contributions to your entities, the state has an important responsibility, in my mind, to create an ecosystem for those individuals that are able to give, to stay in our state. You know, the exodus of, of people, I, I know New York is unique in what it offers, but for an individual to choose between Connecticut and Florida, and for them to be a 51% resident, they're going to contribute their philanthropy dollars to Florida institutions. We've seen that already, and, and it makes sense. So I think the important part of what we have to do is create a budget that is predictable, that allows you to plan your business, that allows you to plan what you have to do and not switch midterm. It doesn't change whether what you do in, in the Barnum Museum and in, in, in the, the Fairfield Museum to GE. You want predictability. We need to provide that. I think the other thing that I would offer all of you when you interact with, quote, politicians, in some ways, you all take a cobbler without the shoe approach. Because what you do is you approach a politician, you approach budgetary issues as though, here's what we do, it's critical, please help us. Well, you need to understand, there are 150,000 other organizations coming up to Hartford, presenting their case, presenting incredible needs. What you all do every single day in, what, in your business is you touch people, you, you engage and you interact. You make them understand why it is important. You need to do the same with those political leaders to make them not only identify you as a line item, but to identify you as an entity that enriches lives. And, and I think it's important to understand that the other component that's critical for me, and, and what the Fairfield Museum has done, what the various other organizations have done, it is even though we are in the town of Fairfield, the groups that you hear about are from Bridgeport. They're from New Haven that come and celebrate the richness of our history. And so when we talk about the, the outreach to different communities, it isn't just you're philanthropic. It, you have to understand, art heals the soul. You know, I, I, I think in this day and age where there's so much contention, perhaps you should go to people and say, look, what do you stand for and not what party you're in? And I'll make it clear, I don't support Trump in some of the rhetoric. I don't support the cutting of NEA. But at the same time, you have to engage and make a connection. And splitting into divisiveness doesn't work. Good morning. A lot of people say lawyers can't say good morning in under five minutes, so <laughs> I'm really feeling some pressure. And again, I get to talk after the politicians, so I think that's a good thing. Um, so uh, David read my bio. I, did David read my bio? Who read my bio? John read my bio. Thank you very much. Um, you know, my law firm has been around in this neighborhood literally uh, since 1951. If you have not heard of Cone and Wolf, I am not doing my job. <laughs> um, 
and, and hopefully you've heard good things. Um, you know, when we look at how to spend our marketing dollars, and make no mistake about it, the money that our law firm contributes to organizations, cultural organizations, civic organizations, et cetera, those are our marketing dollars, right? So we have to look at it from the perspective of what are we trying to accomplish, where do we get the biggest bang for our buck, who do we want to be in the community? And I'm proud to say that, you know, starting with our founders, Herb Cohen, who was a very big patron of the arts in Westport in the, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, um, you know, that tradition has really carried through. And for whatever reason, um, when I look every year at, at the massive spreadsheets of, of organizations that we're going to fund, um, there is a disproportionate number of arts organizations. Now, I think that's a good thing. Disclaimer, my wife was development director at the Westport Arts Center for five years. <laughs> um, but but that, that trend was present at our firm long before she went there, and, and it continues now that she's no longer working in that capacity. Um, so what is it about arts organizations? You know, so first and foremost, um, just to echo two things that Holly and Joe said, it's about investing in our community, and it's about personal connection, right? We're a little country law firm, right? We may be around for 60 years, we may have 50 lawyers, we may have four offices, but no one's heard of us outside the state of Connecticut. There are people in Hartford that tell me they've never heard of us. I think they have, they're just saying that. Um, so, you know, for us, nothing's going to New York, nothing's going to Boston. You know, we invest in our communities. Our offices are in Bridgeport, Danbury, Orange, and Westport, and we look for opportunities to partner with organizations in those communities. Now, that being said, uh, we were, there are 50 lawyers in our firm, and every year we go through a process. Tell us what organizations you want to fund, and at what level, and why. And we had, to com we had to come up with guidelines because we needed to figure out, you know, there has to be more to it than it would be a good thing to do. Being a good thing to do is a good reason, but it can't be the only reason. So we look at um, organizations where people in the firm have personal connections, either direct involvement on a committee or a board, or a client who's got direct involvement in a committee or a board. Um, we want to make sure there's community significance to the organization. Um, Oftentimes, we're representing, we're, we're representing, we are supporting organizations um, that are really, really scraping for funding, and we realize that. And like every other organization that you are, you know, approaching to partner with, I'm sure we wish we could give more in, in more places. Um, every so often, we have the conversation, well, instead of contributing to 100 or 130 organizations this year um, in, in varying amounts that are not that huge, you know, maybe we should just pick three. And, and make a, you know, make a bigger statement. Um, and the conclusion is always the same, which is we can't do that. You know, that's not who we are. There are 50 lawyers in this firm, all with very valuable connections and diverse interests, um, and organizations that they work hard in, uh, and organizations that are really important. So, you know, for those of you that are affiliated with organizations that our firm doesn't represent, I realize being here today gives you my name, my telephone number, my email. <laughs> um, that's not going to be enough. Um, it's really about, you know, finding people in our firm or inviting people in our firm to become involved. Um, and, and one of the nice things is that, you know, we really have a business development mindset that we instill in our, our lawyers from, from right out of law school, which is go out in the community and get involved in things. So, you know, there's no shortage of people in the firm that want to be involved with your organizations. It's all about finding the right match. Great. Thank you very much. So, Kathy, is it possible for you to read one of the questions that was emailed in advance? Because I don't have those in front of me. Use the mic, I understand. So we're going to spend 10 minutes just looking at some of the questions that already came in, and then 10 minutes, David, with getting more questions from the audience, correct? OK. All right, so here's, I'll just read the first question. And for everyone on the panel here, while the national trends seem encouraging, the state level information for Connecticut looks dismal. What are the historic trends nationally and at the state level for individual support for the arts? What is the historic level of giving for corporations in Connecticut? Are these two segments increasing while the state is cutting back, or are they two decreasing at the same time? In term, you, you're the government. You know, um, 
the, the, the chart that was provided is a great resource. And, and I think what you see is the dollar amounts that, that, that are, are made available every year. And, and it, it, it's not a huge dollar amount. It really isn't. I mean, when you think about what the Fairfield County Foundation and, and United Way and various other organizations and your, and your big P philanthropy, they're a big entity in, in driving your funding. But it, it is something you, you depend on. You know, it's like, it's like paying the rent. You know, the rent money. What we have done in the state with our unpredictable budgetary cycles is what I said earlier. We, we, we are creating havoc on how you run your business. We are creating havoc on how you can plan out what needs to be done. And I think thirdly is, and, and some of the finance people can offer, is the fact that we are creating a system that are driving out the, the, the intrinsic philanthropy that give, that, that are partners, that, that are an essential part of your success and survival. Actually, that's a good segue. I just asked Stuart or Joseph if they've seen trends uh, up or down in terms of the corporate giving and the private sector. So Joe, Joe may be in a better position to respond to that on, on a larger level because, you know, honestly, I don't really look at what other companies do. You know, it's funny even when I see myself listed as a person to speak about corporations because, yes, we are technically a corporation, but, you know, we're a small business. Um, we know the importance of being um, partners with people in the community. And frankly, you know, we're going to devote, businesses like ours are going to devote a certain number of dollars every year for marketing and business development. And yes, we can spend them in a lot of different ways, but candidly, that number doesn't really change all that much or as, as a percentage of our of our you know our operating budget it doesn't change all that much could uh, i just want to say one thing corporate funding has been going down for years government funding has been going down for years it's a well-known fact every state individual funding is the future of your organizations and there may be all kinds of reasons that government funding is is great and has an imprimatur and so on but it is not going to be the dollar amount that gets you to the next step it's just yeah and i would echo Stuart's uh, so financial financial advisory business accounting practices law firms all tend to think much the same way and sponsorship dollars and charitable giving are a form, essentially, essentially a form of marketing, right? So it's, it's always, um, I'm always asked the question, what's the ROI? Meaning, what do we as a firm expect to get back out of this? So I, right, Joe Pucci might be contributing X amount of the give, the firm's matching gifting policy might give X amount of the gift, and then there are a couple of foundations, uh, one of which is focused on arts, you know, in our case, this Sam Bernstein, the founder of firm, so for certain gifts like Westport Arts Center, there would be a double match actually you know, that would come through. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the line items coming out of the, the, the corporate budget, it's, it's, you know, what are we getting out of this over time? You know, did this lead to new clients? Did this lead to better impression in the community? Uh, did this lead to exposure, you know, in, in events, panels, et cetera, et cetera? So I think you need to help when you're talking to corporate uh, sponsors or donors, or, or even individuals who are somewhat corporately motivated, you need to think about it. You need to think about what's in it for them, not just what's in it for you. Mm -hmm. I'll just ask them for a check to show what you can give them, you know, for that check. So I think um, at this point, let's turn it over to the audience. So some of you may have questions for the panel, and we'd love to hear from you. So don't be shy. This is the only reason they brought me here today. <laughs> Here we go. I have a, a question for Stuart. Um, as a corporate giver, what are you looking for in um, an organization when you give? What are you looking to get out of it? What is your return, return on your investment? So um, I was asked that question last week on a video spot I did for one of the organizations that we support that they're going to take extra potential funders, right? And they said, well, why do you advertise for this? And I said, it's not advertising. You know, I know you think it's advertising. That's fine. And you carry it. What are we looking for? I mean, first of all, we're looking for organizations that, that have um, a, a real footprint, you know, um, and it doesn't mean it has to be an old organization, just an organization that we, we perceive to be meaningful, so we need to make that case for us. 
Yeah, Holly. Uh, I'm so interested when you say, if you live in Connecticut, give here. And that New York organizations are very appealing, they're highly visible, and the ego appeal, I, I, I hear that. How, how can you suggest that we would best make our case that way? <clears throat> well, I think getting somewhere close to the individuals who um, do hold a huge percentage of the wealth in Connecticut is the first step, and whether it's their assistant, their caretakers, their however you can get one-on-one uh, -on -one to someone within their uh, network, if you want to say, if you can't get directly to them. But I think it's very, very easy to make your case once you can be in front of someone who's receptive to a conversation. I mean, you're all serving much more than your immediate communities. You all do tremendous outreach programs that benefit people, children, whoever, that don't have access to um, the arts in the way that we would all like. Uh, scholarship programs to, to kids who cannot afford to be part of certain programs. It's very compelling if you just have to get the ear. And there is, um, you know, I'm a controversial person lay a little guilt on them. I mean, you know, <laughs> that they live here. And, and I will say, knowing so many arts uh, organizations in Florida, it, they suffer from the people who are Floridian residents who do not give in Florida because they still have, feel they have a bigger ego buy-in somewhere else. And same in Aspen, the amount of wealth there, but it's their third home and they don't give there. So, but you, you have people, obviously, who are making who could give you, I, I mean, I just did something very creative, getting one work of art out of someone. And if you read the paper this week, Aggie Gunn just sold one painting for $150 million and, and okay, she's an extraordinary philanthropist and there's no one like her. And that fund, and she's such a leader that everyone is now uh, putting money into that fund. The fund is for uh, racial equality in jails and uh, some other issues, but if you can come up with an idea that will be less perhaps painful to the person and show how much how tremendous impact it could make where they live, it's a no-brainer. You just have to get there, which is hard. Uh, but I suggest it's well worth your while to try. And possibly in a little consortium. I mean, it, it, bonding together is such a great idea, you know, so, and, and it's not either or. I mean, if you, some like-minded places can get a meeting, you know, there's tremendous wealth. And so a check that could be divided three ways would still be enormously beneficial to all of you. What organization in the room can solve the equity issue on their own? Any hands? If a funder wants to solve that issue, you know, how do we do that? Another question? Yeah, this is for Senator Hung. Um, I, I, you talk about predictable environment for funding, and you talk about we're creating havoc for your organizations. Are you uh, suggesting that perhaps the uh, arts and historical organizations should not come to the Capitol? I mean, what, is you, what are you trying to...
without a doubt, you should come to the Capitol. But they should come to you. And it sounds really silly, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you, 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 you persist. Look, I was in the middle of, of a in-depth session and literally spending the last three weeks up in Hartford. David was persistent. <laughs> and, and I'm here because David was diligent and, and I believe in this. I've been to many programs. Bottom line is, as I said earlier, what you do in, 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 in the arts and culture is you touch people. When you go up to Hartford, you're in their setting. You're just another budget line item. But when they come here, when they go visit the Fairfield Theater Company, when they go to the Westport Arts Center, they live, they engage, they, they get touched. So no, please do come up. But you should insist that they come to you and experience what you do. And I think the other part, as we talked about funding, and I'm getting a sense of this, is that there, there is a philanthropic relationship building of this panel. Maybe I'm a little bit different in the way that I see arts and culture as making differences in everyone's lives. And I talk about the outreach programs in which the arts and the culture, like the Westport Playhouse, has their annual Martin Luther King event that they bring school children to sing and dance and, and to celebrate a, a real theatrical performance on a fantastic stage when they would otherwise not be able to do so. So I, I would offer that when you talk about funding and when you talk about pitching for state and, and federal funds, that you, you share that the arts is not simply for the high asset wealth individuals. It is for everyone. It is creating and outreaching and touching children and, and individuals who, who suffer from many different, from poverty, from substance abuse, from, from mental health, from, from violence, that art can be a tool to heal. That then, I, I will tell you, you touch a legislator in what we believe in, but you need to have them come to you. You do, you know, I, I, I brought Senator Gomes to a concert at the Fairfield Theater Company. He represents Bridgeport. He's never come to Fairfield. We had a Motown concert and he said this was one of the best venues he's ever been to. So when we talk about funding for Fairfield Theater Company, he understands it's not just taking care of a community or a set of ideas. It is making a difference on everyone's lives. So, so make them come to you. Well, we did last night <coughs> the open house day, and we tried to get every legislator to go to their communities to see their heritage organizations. It worked. I don't know if it worked. <laughs> well, I, I would offer this. It is no different than going after your high donors. Yes. The fact is, you cultivate a relationship. You literally say, hmm, you know, I'm your constituent. And I'd like you to come, and I'm expecting you to participate. To take privilege, because I'm the one holding the mic, um, <laughs> to, to really engage in that conversation, we brought all of our Bridgeport delegation to the museum a couple times a year for a hard hat tour, and I stood them right underneath the failing dome, and it got real, really fast, you know? <laughs> so, yes, I think we have full Bridgeport delegation support because they come, and they're, now they're a part of the story. And they own it, so. But you got to get Westport. you got to get Fairfield. You are so invited. I'll be back at the museum. <laughs> David, is it our... No, no, no. Oh, so we're a, a little yeah. more time? Okay. Yeah. So are there questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, and I'll ask Holly, because you seem to be a really straight shooter as well as the rest of you on the board. Um, and this isn't just a statement. I want a real answer. What just happened to the public, where they had people withdraw because they didn't support the actual, that one story? Um, how, and I'm asking a real question. I'm not trying to make a statement. Do we need to play it safe when that's not in our nature as artists to try to push the boundaries so that we can continue to get funding? There are so, f it's a good question, but there are very, f very few examples of that. Um, it's a 
tiny, you know, Giuliani withdrawing money from Brooklyn Museum because of the Ophelia painting, whatever, you can count them on one hand. I would suggest that you continue to do everything you do and uh, in the rare occasion that something is found offensive or not acceptable, it's generally a corporate funder or a government funder. And um, again, if you look at the size, uh, I'm going to come back. I would keep doing what you're doing. It's few and far between. And as you probably know, the, the bank funding the public only withdrew its support for the one production. They did not withdraw their support. So um, I if you look at the amount, your si staff sizes, the amount of time it takes to prepare a grant, to make a pitch, to so on, and you look at the opportunities, I'm sorry to keep pounding on this, uh, in what you can get, and it is important to involve the government, of course it is, and yes, keep inviting them to everything. I mean, keep at it, I'm, I'm totally with you on that, but, the biggest yield is going to be in the individual area. Not to say corporations aren't important, they are, but it depends on the size of your staff and how much energy you have to go out. And yes, you want to involve your communities, but it really de depends on your size and how you know one chunk of money could propel you forward to maybe have more staff or, you know. So it's a juggling act, very complicated. Thanks. This is all uh, um, very helpful. Um, all of you have stressed the making the personal connection uh, with individual donors, and I think uh, I think we're weighted toward the staff position here. Uh, my question is, uh, in terms of board engagement of their peer-to-peer -peer asking, uh, how have those expectations evolved in recent years, and how can we as staff people engage our boards to make more effective uh, asks. I mean, I can start with that because I've tended to be on development committee chair, of development committee, and then president of organizations, and it all involves peer-to-peer -peer ask. Um, it's it's always been challenging. I think will always continue to be challenging because uh, very few people like to ask other people for money. Very few. Some love it. Some, you know, it. it probably is highly correlated with a sales aptitude, right? It's a similar skill set. But most board members, you know, really don't want to go there. And, and uh, maybe they want to bring somebody as a guest to events. That's comfortable, right? But uh, part of it is, is I think, both one-on-one, -on -one helping them get comfortable, you know, and, and sort of mentoring and working together. So those that do, you know, hopefully have one or two on each board that really do understand and, and enjoy uh, or at least are good at it, can do it, that can mentor the others. But um, I think also to be fair, um, you know, there's going to be an 80-20 rule. Don't, don't waste a lot of your time and energy on trying to get every board member to produce fundraising dollars for you because they're not, in my experience, ever going to go there. You might have two or three or, or five out of 20 or something like that, right, that are really going to do anything for you in fundraising. The rest maybe will be friend raisers, bringing people to events, and you need to then know who your, you know, kind of who your fundraisers and closers are, right? Um, and and quite honestly, best is when you, you know, can afford staff, right, that are professional fundraisers that can be your closers, right? So then, the board who's comfortable introducing people, bringing people in the fold, can can then feel like they hand it off and and the business gets done, you know. Add one thing. Um, if you're going into a major campaign of some kind, and you should choose the board members that might be yes. willing to work with you, obviously. But we actually did one-on-one -on -one coaching. So here we're sitting here. They're going to say that, and the director, in my case, it was me, was extremely active in doing that. And I would be present during the ask if they wanted to, so I could say the money amount, which was awfully hard for them to get out of their mouths. I don't mean to make a joke of it, but that you know, you, people need support. And um, all of our Goldman Sachs people would not ask anyone because they knew it would be a quid pro quo. Was, you know, so they had the most money, but were hopeless. 
So, you know, you have to, it's really, it's really not about the most wealth. It's about who is willing to do that work with you. And my funniest anecdote, excuse me for blathering on, was um, our approach to Henry Kravis, which I was working on with a board member. And we had the whole, we were going to corner him at this thing. And then he went in the men's room, so I couldn't go in with my board <laughs> member. And we got two million bucks in the men's room. But I was outside the door going, oh, God, this is so awkward. All, no, sometimes the best plans don't work out, you know, but, but uh, you got to really punt. I mean, there are times that you just, you can, you can blow it, it can be really awkward, or maybe it can work, you know, it, but support of the board members is really important. I just, I actually have something I want to throw out to you, Tony, um, from a policy perspective. I would hope that at some point going forward, money's drying up at the state, but the state has a lot of influence it can lay out, and it's giving a lot of incentives to big companies to move here. Henkel, Amazon, and others have been coming to the state with a lot of capital investment from the state and support. And there is an opportunity to lay out in those deals, candidly, a little bit more expectation to those corporations that they're going to give back to local communities, that communities won't have to express over time how they are helping to community build, create a dynamic Connecticut environment, um, contribute to a sense of place in their communities, whatever it is, I think there are outcomes that can be developed that tie to that. We've let people, I've been around 30 years in my professional career, and I remember the days where there was an, a, an expectation that corporations gave back to their communities. We're all afraid to, I'm not calling it a mandate, I'm calling it a value. Let's build that value back up in Connecticut, and the policymakers in Hartford and the deal makers can help in that perspective as we're giving tons of taxpayers' money out to secure these companies. There needs to be a more diverse set of expectations laid out, including jobs, including contributions back to the community and to building a better Connecticut. Should we just move on? I just want to respect your time uh, and, and the other panelists. Uh, here's the deal on policy. I, I think what you heard earlier is the fact that corporate contributions have been on the decline, just as government contributions have been. It is a nature of the beast that's kind of evolved. And, and the, the challenge is with the Hinkles and the Jackson Labs and, and the first five, which has now become the first 20, um, those corporation cultures are distinctly different than what it used to be. And, and I think I'm going to go back to when you talk policy, the first and foremost job that we have to do in state government is to create an, an ecosystem for businesses to thrive. And, and I would offer to every one of you that's looking at philanthropy, you're going to go after the big whale, maybe corner someone in the bathroom, <laughs> but you do what you need to do. But let us not forget the economic engine and the, the inherent contributors of, 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 of philanthropy are small business owners in our state. We're not creating an environment that let people succeed. So my first and foremost policy issue is let us create a predictable ecosystem where people want to stay in the state and people want to grow their businesses in the state and people want to move into the state rather than the converse. So when people believe, and I think that's what was said earlier, when people believe 
that, that they are an inherent part of a, of a community and they're, they're getting the biggest bank out of, bang out of their contributions, you will see that giving continue. But if we don't have a system from a policy standpoint, I can't make any corporation do what they want to do. I, 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 think, I think you have to look at the, 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 the changing tone of philanthropy. And I talked to, to when, when GE left this state to go to Boston, I held a, a forum on nonprofits. And to talk to the foundation and to the United Ways, the big donors are looking for transformative, transformative changes. They're not interested in the role of government subsidy. That's the interesting dynamic for all of you. So I think the biggest focus you want is not you know, that one in a hundred of the big corporations is gonna give you that big check. That's great. But what you should focus on is the small businesses, the people that are entrenched and want to be a part of the community. That's where you're gonna get your biggest bang for the buck. Follow the suit of, of the foundation that, that look at that. You got corporate relationships, but it is the bread and butter of every small business in your community that supports you not only in the money, but in their soul and in their values. So, so I, I may disagree on that policy standpoint. Uh, at Hartford, what we have to do is create an environment. But, but the changing dynamics of going after that big whale may have to change because that's just not the way corporations are giving. And, I, and maybe I can be persuaded otherwise by I'll the, the experts on this. <laughs> All right, thank you. That was very valuable. Um, so we'll, we, there are two more opportunities for asking questions. Uh, right now, we've got a 10-minute coffee break. Please come back um, when instructed, and we'll have our second panel. Please join me in thanking our first panel. Thank you.